Hello and welcome to another episode of Invalid Entry. My name is James Taylor. Uh, before Christmas we did these uh, little videos and one of the things I did was uh, Kosh Doflakes with fractals and a couple of people would talk about fractals uh, and would like to know more about fractals so I thought I'd do a uh, ridiculous primer on fractals. Uh, I'm not going to go fully into fractal mathematics. Um, but it's really interesting over mathematics. I think a lot of people think fractals are just these computer-generated things or these repetitive patterns, and they're not. They're fractals are a much wider area of mathematics about uh, shapes or algorithms or numbers which are uh, interesting at every depth. There's no commonality between them. There's no that you can't uh, easily come up with. Um, like derivations of formulas or lines and graphs, things like that. So fractals that we're, we're interested in, like the Mandelbrot fractal, are a particular set of those fractals, but there are other fractals as well. So we are going to talk about specifically the Mandelbrot fractal and how it works and how we generate it uh, and why it's interesting. But to begin with that, uh, I realize some people don't necessarily understand the mathematics underneath it, so I thought I'd go very quickly into the mathematics, and I hope this color works. I hope this is black. So very quickly, a quick reminder, and that is way too bright. Uh, you cannot see that line whatsoever. So I'm just going to see if I can uh, just turn this light out. There we go. There you can see the line. Sorry about the shadow at this point then. Let's hope this can be up. Okay, so this is the number line. It has naught in the middle. It has large numbers on this side. It has small numbers on this side. And I hope everyone realizes that we're not limited to just the numbers on the line. So you might have like a 1 and a 2 on this line. But there are numbers in between the numbers. There are actually an infinite number of numbers between naught and 1 alone, let alone 1, 2. So the first thing we need to remember is that when we use computers, there aren't an infinite number of numbers, there are only a preset number of numbers. Even if we use floating point numbers, there are a finite number of numbers that fit between 0 and 1. And interestingly, there are more numbers that fit between 0 and 1 than that fit between 1 million and 1 million and 1, and so on, uh, when you're using a computer. When you're using mathematics, there, there are infinite number of numbers between any, any, between any two numbers you can find, there's an infinite number of numbers in between. And not all those we can represent with writing down numbers. Some of those are fractal, some of those are rational, and some of those are computational numbers. And some of those are even more exotic than that. But you have some numbers here like minus 1 and minus 2. Right, so we have some negative numbers. We have this number naught, which is an interesting number in its own right. Uh, and this is the number line, and this is what my kids do at school. They say you move along the number line by adding, and you move back by subtracting, and you can multiply and you can divide the number line up. Uh, but this is good when you have a certain things and they can represent things in the real world, such as if I have two pounds and I give you one, I subtract one and I end up on one pound. Or if you owe me, you can, say, you can owe me two pounds, so I have minus two pounds. That's, that's sort of a concept we can just about get behind. Um, but what if this was goats? If this is how many goats I owned and I wanted to, I suddenly owned a cow. Well, I can't add a cow to goats. The way we represent that is we have another number line running at 90 degrees to the first number line. So this might be the number of goats, and this is the number of cows I have. And again, this has a 1 and a 2 in it, and this has a minus 1 and a minus 2. Now, um, there are certain real-world applications to this as well, and the graphing how many cow cows and goats I might have, but also when you start doing things like uh, voltages and current. Uh, voltage and current are kind of independent, but they're also kind of linked. But you can have higher voltage for the same current and so on. So you might use something like this where you have these graphs. So understand there are mathematical applications to these, these theoretical maths is important. And what's interesting here is that we start getting the question of, well, if I add one cow onto one cow, I'll go up to two. So we know when we start talking about vectors, this is what we have. So if I have one cow, one goat, I'm there. And that we can call a vector, uh, that angle there. And straight away, there are two ways of representing this vector. The first way is by saying it is 1 along, and we call this x, we call this y, we call it i and j, or j and i, or whatever we want to call it. We can say it is the coordinate 1, 1. And we always, just um, practicality, always write the across first, and we write the up, down. So that is a 1, 1 vector. And if I wanted to add um, two cows on but no goats, I can add the vector, not 2, oh, I need a 3 up here, which means I'm adding that vector on there, I get the resulting vector like that. Okay, so when you're adding two vectors together, you're literally taking the first vector and taking the second vector, put a line above it so we know it's a vector. That is how you add two vectors, and you get a plus b as the vector like that. There is another way of knowing the same vectors. Okay, which is to say that the first vector is actually an angle from the horizontal and a magnitude, i.e. a length of the line. 
okay? These two things are the same. They're, they're, they're just different ways of writing that expressing the same vector. But what's really interesting here is when we want to do something which is multiplication. If we want to do a times b, I want a vector times b vector. The way this works is, the easiest way to work this out, is to take the angle there. If your b vector was a straight line like that, then your b vector, you write it out at zero. That would be a right angle. The way you work it out is the new angle is A's angle plus B's angle and the new length is A's value times B's value. Okay? Important fact. So addition is easier to do with your coordinates and multiplication is easier to do if you've got your angle. Otherwise you've got to work out um, the actual angle you've got to do, you know, your sine theory to cos theory and things like that to work out with your angles, add your angles together, then that, then multiply your vector length up, then do your inverse sine and cos theory to actually work out your coordinates. It's quite hard to do if you're if you're studying this one. Um, now we're not going to do a lot of vector math today, but that's important. And the next thing important about this theory is that it now means we can do square roots of numbers. Okay, so if I can square, first of all, I can square numbers because square numbers. If I've got a vector like this, if I square it then the length is squared and the angle doubles. Okay, so this angle doubles to here and the length squared. Okay, it's very important to realise that I can square numbers now, double the angle, square the length. Uh, and that gives me a new coordinate. All right, I'm rushing through vector primer mathematics, it's important. It is important for, especially for the Mandelbrot formula. Uh, very, very quickly, as a very quick aside, We've got this line here. If I square a number that is on this line, it has an angle of zero. So when I square it, it still has zero plus zero is zero, and therefore the length is squared. So it still works for normal scalar lines that vector mathematics still works for, it, which means this algorithm here of doubling and squaring is so there. There is a question of what is the square root of minus one. And now the square root is half the angle and square root the value. So the square root of the value of 1, the length of 1 is 1, and halving the angle of 180 is 90. So it actually means the square root of minus 1 is a 90 degrees perpendicular, or actually you can even put it through your space, it's the entire uh, circle of, of, of points um, at 90 degrees to the number line of 1. Arguably it's not this value, with a semicircle, it's not this value, because this value, if you square this value, you're actually taking three quarters plus another, ah, no, it, it is this value, see, three quarters plus another three quarters, but one. If the value was not one, if it's just above one, or let's, let's take this value of one here, if I square one, it becomes one, and naught plus naught is naught, so it stays on the one point. But if I'm just off one, it drifts off. And if I'm just off one this way, it drifts off as well. And it generally drifts off in this in this sort of um, clockwise direction because you're adding values on. It can, however, go all the way round and, and be just behind. So it can go, but you're always drifting off in this clockwise direction. Okay. Important to notice here that one stays where it is. When they started looking at this mathematics, they realised in this space, if you're interested in squaring numbers and then keep on squaring them, you end up with these paths. So if I square it and square it and square it and square it, I end up either with spirals. And they either spiral outwards or they spiral inner into. So they realise that for a particular formula, I just, just point squared, new point at n plus 1 is, is that. Or actually, probably write it the other way, pn equals pn minus 1 squared. So if I have this iterative formula here, it then goes in a loop. And as my camera is, is, is freezing every now and then, but I hope you're getting the drift of this. We will swap to code very, very, very shortly. Okay, so some very clever mathematicians, uh, you know, 100, 200, 100 and 140-ish years ago. Uh, just a quick correction here. The One of the main mathematicians who discovered this was born 140 years ago. Uh, the math was maybe done 120 to 110 years ago to begin with, and then obviously extended uh, throughout the last 100 years. Uh, down to about 100 years ago, I believe that's sort of time where it was talking about, way before they went on computers, realised that they could use these, and there was this idea of attractors and repulsors for particular formulas. So 
the, the formula that Mandelbrot knew about before he used a computer to draw it. So he didn't invent this formula, but he was the first person to use a computer to draw it. Um, basically said that the, the next point is equal. And there's two, there's two versions of this formula, by the way. Um, uh, 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 Z squared plus P, N minus 1. And the other version of this formula is what makes the Julia set, which is where you do p squared plus c. And you have to add a vector 1. And the reason you have to add a vector 1 is because otherwise you just end up with perfect circles. Okay. And what he's basically asked the question was, if I take a coordinate, if I take a starting point here, and this is going to be 1, and this is going to be 2. Because I, I can tell you if it's less than 1, it goes in the loop and, 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 and doesn't come out. Right? It's, that, it's that simple. If it's less than 1, it spirals inwards. If it's 1, bang on 1, interesting things happen. If it's over one, then you end up um, with one. You end up with a perfect circle. If it's, if it's over one, you end up. So we're interested in the range between not one. He basically said that if it's between more than one, I'm going to draw a circle here on the. Oh, look at that circle! It's very eggish. Um, this is minus two. This is two. This is minus two. He said. People ask, how long is it before the spiral escapes this boundary, this imaginary boundary of two? So you can go, okay, well, if first of all, if I start here, first of all, it goes to, uh, it doubles the angle, but it also adds this, this value on. So you sort of goes, it spirals out like this. And here, it escapes between the one, two, three, and four. So it's somewhere between the second and fourth. That That's fundamental. So the first question is, does it escape or not? Now, the problem is that, there are points here where it escapes basically at the infinitive iteration, right? So it, it will escape, but it always escapes at the infinitive. There's a boundary here. So we can start saying, well, well which points escape at the, the the tenth or the hundredth iteration? Which means you have to do these calculations. And the problem is, the second problem is that there are points next to each other which won't. And because there's an infinite, infinite, infinite amount of points just between 0 and 1 and 1 and 2, it means there are an infinite number of points here to calculate for. Now yes, if you calculate at this point, then yes, you've also calculated for this point because if this point escapes, this point escapes in one less sort of thing. But the problem we now have is when we have computers, we have pixels. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to, I'm going to do a very bad fractal here. I'm going to, going to have um, some very big pixels. We're going to calculate for this point, and for this point, and for this point. And we're going to colour this entire square, which is just one pixel, remember, the value of that point. So we're basically, if it escapes at 2, if it escapes after after 10, colour red. If 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 uh, escape after uh, 50, colour uh, blue. Else, uh, it didn't escape, uh, colour black that that's that's basically what we do so we're going to color this this pixel in depending on the value of the point there but there are points in between that we don't know about and the important thing to realize is that when we when we do the first step the first step may go to this point here which is actually a value between these two points so even though we're going to do this calculation we actually are going to do the calculation over and over for all these points on the grid but the actual subsequent steps won't be of any help to us for calculating other points they are they are going to slip between the lines Basically, what he found was instead of getting geometric shapes come out like perfect circles, if you, if if c was zero, you get a perfect zero, so you get a series of circles coming out. Obviously, if you pick a point outside two, then it's already escaped, and we just call that either white or black. We just get it out of the way because it doesn't matter. So you do have a perfect circle, and what we realise is that as you decrease, as you increase the number of iterations you look at, the line of what escapes and what doesn't becomes more and more fractal. And if you take one of these points, he basically goes, yep, yeah, if you take a point just next to two and it escapes on the first iteration, as you go further in, it's more and more iterations before it escapes. But the boundary between where it escapes and where it doesn't escape has basically looks a bit weird. It kind of looks like, like, like this. But when you dive into it and zoom in, you start reading there's these extra nodes and there's this border is what is fractal, and that's what's fractal, and that's what becomes suddenly very, for a lot of people, and me and Claire included, very beautiful. Um, I realise we're like 15 minutes into this video, we're now going to swap into Python really quickly, um, because in Python, 
doing this calculation is really easy. Like you'd be, as I said back on the previous bit of paper, to actually do it using numbers and coordinates, you have to do you, pi, uh, you have to do sine theory and cos theory to work out the angles. Python comes with an inbuilt complex number calculation, which basically means we can treat these as complex numbers, we can drop them as complex numbers, and we can generate fractals in incredibly easy amounts of time. Okay, so now we're moving into Python. Uh, don't worry about these imports at the top. I am going to be using NumPy and Matplotlib just to be able to visualise the, the points on a graph. You don't need those if you're going to make fractals. In fact, we're just going to use Pill for, for generating the images later. Uh, but this is basically, I'm going to use those. And there's going to be a little bit of code which you're just going to take for granted when I do the graph map, the mapping of the graph. So basically, the we have this thing, an inbuilt called complex, which you pass in two numbers. And it basically gives you a complex number coming out the end. Uh, and these complex numbers are fantastic. You can you can make a couple of these uh, be uh, equals complex uh, uh, one minus three like that. And I can do a plus b. I can do b uh, b plus b. I can do b times a. It, you know, I can do all the maths basically without even thinking about the fact these are complex numbers. I can treat them as, as points, locations, whatever, and it will work. Um, you can even do things which are quite cool, like you can do abs A, which actually gives you the, the value of the length to that point from zero, which is kind of funky because we're probably going to do something like if abs A is greater than two. Right? That is going to be the basics of whether it's left that circle or not. That's very powerful. You can do things with these. Um, some operators work, some don't. Majority of them do. So you can do something like pal uh, a2 to give you uh, a squared, or a to the 5 to give you a cubed. A, a, sorry, a times a times a times a times a times a. You know, um, And you can do stuff like that. You might be able to start thinking, well, I can import uh, math, and I can do sin a. Uh, that's, no, you can't do math dot sin a. And that doesn't work because it just doesn't work. However, there's a thing called CMath. Now, CMath is not the C standard math library, which you might think is actually the complex math library. And then you can do CMath at CNA, and it gives you the answer. So you can do, um, there are a couple of extra libraries you can look into if you want to do really funky maths. What C sin of a pongamous point is, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I haven't thought that one through in my head. Anyway, so we've got this idea of complex numbers. Uh, I'm going to have basically an array of points uh, that I'm going to generate. So basically what I'm going to do is, the, to generate a fractal, to know the iteration, I'm going to have a thing called max iterations. I'm going to set it to 100. That's very important because some curves will just go in a loop forever. As I express if it's less than 1, it will just spiral down to the center. Their fractal. Uh, it's going to take an input. And basically what I'm going to do is, I'm going to just do return, return, z times z plus c. No, I'm not. I'm going to do uh, C times C plus Z. I know what I'm doing. <sighs> yeah, I know what I'm doing. Honest. Uh, and the reason I'm doing this is because uh, uh, Z plus C is a comma C. I'm going to take those. Now, what I'm actually going to do is def calc uh, input. Uh, uh, point or points that we want to calculate for, then what we're going to do is um, while fractal uh, C is going to be uh, Z is going to be naught naught, it's going to be my input complex naught naught, while fractal Z C, in fact, Z equals frac uh, if Z is great abs point is greater than 2, return naught, else uh, counter equals naught, counter plus equals 1, counter equals 1 actually, while counter is less than max iterations and abs uh, uh, z is less than 2, Counter plus equals one, but that's not there. So it's one the first time around. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do uh, um, uh, z equals point uh, fractal z constant, and we're just going to put the contents uh, uh, new. Um, oh, I've got my variables mixed up already. So the input point is here. 
the first time round is we're going to put c as the constant no, no, because there's a constant and we're going to put c is equal to the point for the first time round after that uh, z equals that it's going to go round. I believe that's the right combination. I Don't worry if it doesn't, because if I got it backwards, it's going to produce a Julia. If I got it the right round, it's going to produce a Mandelbrot. That, that's basically what it is. So what we can now do is we can basically say, oh, at the end of this, I want to return counter. Okay? So what I can now do is I can now say um, calc for um, location equals, I don't know, con um, complex. Uh, one uh, point seven, which will be outside the one range because it's it, it will be calc location like that, and it's thinking about it, and it's come up with the answer. Um, print the answer is none. Excellent. Uh, that's just a fantastic answer to get here. Uh, duh, 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 duh. What did I do wrong there? So if the point is greater than 2, it returns naught. Otherwise, it should return this counter, which should always be a number. Uh, it should not return none. That's for sure. Oh, there you go, too. I, I, hadn't, I hadn't run it. Okay, there you go. Numbers coming at the bottom. And I can change this a little bit. So 1.2 comes out with a 2. If I put that down to 1 and this point, point 0.1, then I get two. If I get a point one, point naught one, two, excellent point nine, I get a three. Okay, so I am getting different numbers coming out. Um, the the reason is I, I actually need to pick a number other than one. I need to pick a number more in the complex area or in the chaos area, which we'll be looking at in a second. Okay, so anyway, this is producing numbers. What I actually want to do is return the points. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say points equal array with c uh, as the first one and then what we're going to do is do points dot append point or rather z this point return counter points return counter naught points okay so um y data like that so we now have print data we've got these locations dropping at the bottom and you see they're beginning to be whilst i put small numbers in to begin with they're beginning to come off slightly tight now actually i don't want to do that um z c there you go that works nicely um so what we want to do is we want to graph those very quickly and i actually want to draw lines between the graph as well so what we're going to do very quickly is make a function to draw def draw uh, data data uh, circle size I've, I've done this before line equals false circle size equals uh, 2 just about to give some default variables in there so fig x equals plot dot sub plots like that last point equals none then four point in data x dot plot point dot real point dot image so basically on a complex number it's got an attribute called the real and the imaginary component which is basically what those are that should be a dot there um, and then basically yeah, I'm going to do it as a, as a no dot Ooh, fingers are in the wrong place um, uh, if last point and line so basically if the line is set to true and there is a last point it's not the first iteration uh, then we're going to do x dot plot point dot real last point dot real point dot image last point dot image which i always think is a bit weird because uh, i always think you should give an x and what x y and an x y but you actually give an x x and a y y um that's matplotlib for you um last point equals point and then basically that will build up um and there's a couple of things i'm just going to copy paste in here which are all of these um and there's a reason why um because basically they're just going to sort out the axis and sort out the range. Because I'm only really interested in circles up to two. I'm going to just force those to be uh, two. I should really do this as uh, circle size uh, minus circle size minus 0.5. Circle size plus 0.5. So if we change the circle size, you know, if you really wanted to do this properly. 
Um, I don't really, but you know. Uh, circle equals plot dot circle. Um, I want it to be on naught naught as the uh, center point. It's going to be a circle size. Uh, color equals going to be blue, just so we get a nice bit of color in there. And fill equals false, so it doesn't actually fill it in. Uh, and then we've got to add that. So unlike these ones where you're actually adding it to the axis straight away, you've actually got to make a circle and add the circle by an artist thing. It's a bit, it's just, it's just matplotlib, which is a thing on its own. Okay, so now we've got a function here. I've got a thing called data. So I should just go to draw data, data. And there you go. You've got two of the circles on there. Now the third one you see is well outside that plot line. Uh, and I'm going to do um, line equals false. Uh, and you see those lines in there. So if we now um, do this again for a better combination, if I actually start um, with a complex of minus uh, 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.2, somewhere there, then you can see it's about, it, it's gonna, it stays in that area because it basically loops around every time. Uh, if I try a, a bigger number, there you go. You can see it's starting to iterate in and out. It is iterating, getting larger and larger and larger until suddenly it's so large it now pings out the back. So that one actually had a value of uh, 15. Okay. So what we're now getting is we're now getting numbers out, and that sort of shows how this, this calculation is doing, that you're doing lots and lots and lots of points until finally it leaves the circle um, as a thing. Now, I don't actually want to generate this for every single pixel. I only actually care about the, this number. You, some people, when you see the very smooth fractals, they don't just generate 15 and then so all the all the ones which are 15 are one colour, all the ones that are 16 are another colour. They actually can generate where along this line. So this is like quite late in 15 because it's quite close. It's like 15.8 sort of thing or 14.8 or rather than 15. So they can generate actually a value depending on where on this line it crosses the circle. I only care about it, it was the 15th attempt before it crossed the circle. Um, so basically, what we can now do is think about think about actually drawing this onto an actual fractal, um, and for that, it, it's quite in, it's quite in, quite easy. What we're going to do is we're going to bring in uh, a pill, um, just so we have pill in scope. I'm going to make an image equals pill dot image uh, dot uh, new uh, mode equals RGB, and we're going to make it size equal to. Uh, uh, 500, 500. Um, I should really have that as a size variable. Uh, there we go. Uh, size. There we go. Right, so const is going to be the naught naught vector, and then basically what we're going to do is we've got to remember that I, if I make each, if I make this the input coordinate, it's always going to be outside two. So I want to scale that down. So I'm just for the moment I'm going to hack this a little bit. I, I there are better ways of doing this. There's better ways of doing color calculations. There's better ways of doing things. So basically, I'm going to uh, uh, four i in range size, four j in range size. Uh, basically, what we're going to do is the the location, the actual location we're at. First of all, it's going to be um, half size equals size over two. Just so we have that equals size minus half size. Center equals equals going to be naught naught. Uh, this is going to be to shift in a moment. Uh, in fact, I'm not going to worry about that moment. We're going to be centering it in zero zero for the moment, and then uh, uh, JJ equals uh, J. Size, oh no, I don't want to size my half size, but I minus half size, J minus half size. So the increments, the, the number of point or actual real distance per pixel, we're going to calculate this uh, by basically saying it's going to be the scale over the size. Okay, and the max scale we're going to do right now is we're just going to put a hard code of 0.4 in there for the moment. Uh, and see what comes out. 0 0.4, 0 0.5 should be around the right number. So the, what we're going to do is that the point that we're going to look at is going to be the complex of i times the increment, jj times increment. 
Okay. Now we can off shift the center there, but that's going to be um, that's going to be how we calculate that. Uh, so the counter no, the counter data equals going to be. I don't really care about this data, but it's going to be. Uh, I'm going to uh, calc. Um, uh, this just takes a point, doesn't it? So it's just going to take the point like that, and the limit's going to be 100 because we've got the max iterations. So what we're going to do is do pixels. Oh, uh, one thing we have to do, by the way, is here we have to do pixels equals image dot load. So it's a bit weird this relationship between the image and the pixel object, um, but it just is. The pixel object using the original coordinates I'm at are going to equal um, uh, color equals because the scale is up to 255. At the moment, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that point. I don't want 255 colors coming out. Um, I can do two. In fact, uh, let's just do it. So 255 divided by um, the, or oh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 25 multiplied by the counter. The counter can be between 0 and 100 actually. So that will make a very large number. So 2.5 math.floor that. Uh, math might not be imported. There we go. So I actually want an integer of that. There we go. Uh, it's going to be colour, colour, colour. So we're going to have a black and white picture. Uh, and that's basically that done. right? So this is going to run. Now this is running across 500 pixels across, 500 pixels down, up to 100 iterations. Um, and we'll see where it goes. There is a very slight possibility I've run off the end. No, it's run already. So now what we can do is just look at the image like that and we get back absolutely nothing. And it's all right to get back nothing. It's all right to get back you know, mistakes or errors. Uh, we just have to dive in a little bit and work at this. I wonder if the, the problem here is um, uh, print. Oh, no, hold on a second. Uh, print point. I'm going to print that off now. Um, and these numbers here are actually looking all right. Although they're looking a bit small, if I'm honest with you, uh, because it should be starting at like um, minus two. So that's two. I'm going to run that aside. I'm going to put a break in just so I get these values coming out. My my increment is certainly not. Um, very good. Oh, that's that's a bit painful. I say this this is a slow way of calculating because I'm calculating on those data points. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the data points off here. Um, I'm just going to get rid of that and get rid of that and get rid of that. No matter. That. Uh, ba, 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 so I don't care about that. That will save a whole bunch of processing time. I'm actually going to interrupt this kernel. Okay, so that's looking like better fractal cut numbers coming out. Uh, they are looking much better. The first one is at ooh, the first one is at minus one minus one. Still not fantastic here. I wonder if I have to go up to four here. First one is at minus two, minus two. That's better number, right? And it's going down to what looks like minus one, minus two. Right, so let's run that without that break. Uh, can't multiply sequence of non numbers, non in type by type float. Um, can't multiply sequence. Obviously, I've done a mistake here oh I know what the problem is uh, uh, that shouldn't be that uh, counter should be count point Uh, and, oh, it didn't. It didn't pick up the new 
It didn't pick that up because I hit I hit break. That's why. Okay, that is still running. We'll take out the print because it's going to generate you know a lot of output otherwise. And when it runs, it will show us the fractal. So uh, basically, what we're saying here is that that, there's, that this is a really simplistic way of doing it. I say I had a bit of problems getting it in. Uh, so basically, what we now do is we start playing around with some of these variables. We start playing over how we calculate the which which pixel that actually is what value because we're zooming in, zooming in, zooming in on a fractal. Um, and then what we're doing is we're also looking at. In fact, I'm going to enter that kernel there. I'm just going to look at what it's generated so far. So it's generated that much of the pixel, which is pretty good. If I run it again without the print. Um, well, I talk about it. So as you can see here, it's just done it. Like right? it's calculated each pixels and it's smoothed out these ones because I've gone for the full 250 or full 100 colors because I'm using 100 iterations. What I could do is I could divide that number by 10. So instead of getting a number like, I either get everything less than 10, everything more than 10, and that will give a much sharper crisper. As you can see here, there's no smoothing here. All these regions it may not show up on the YouTube compression. But there's actually a big circle here or two. Everything outside is black, and so there's lighter grey. And then there's also this big patch here, this big circle here and here. This general shape is is an interesting shape. And again, you can when you look at the mass and look at how those how the modification works, it sort of ties in. But the, if you look at the boundary between never escaping and escaping eventually, that is the fractal boundary. That that set of that line that there. That's an infinitely long line. Uh, if you calculate it for a certain iteration, like the difference between escaping at 100 and not escaping at 100, then then you get something different. Um, so that sh has finished now. If I actually render that again, you get the full circle. And then you can see here, because it goes grey, it goes a little bit wispy on what we see. Uh, getting the scale that's important, if I zoom in a bit here, what I'm actually going to do is say, if counter is less than 99, then I want the colour to be, the pixels IJ will be um, one thing, else there will be another thing. So here I'm just going to fix these as being um, naught, naught, naught. If the next I'm going to do, in fact I'm going to do naught, naught here actually. So one of the things you can work on, and there's lots of things you can do when you're taking this and extending it, is you can try different formulas. Um, different formulas that come up with different pictures. You, uh, I'll show a couple of those very quickly now we've got a renderer working. There you go. Very much starker. You don't quite, it's not obvious whether these things, these dots here are connected to the main part or not. Uh, but that is a renderer uh, for this. You can begin to do things like, also notice that the, the, the center point is here. Even though it, it is left and weighted, the center point is here. And that's because one times anything just goes out this way. Or zero, or one zero times anything always goes outwards that way. A very straight line. It doesn't loop and therefore lose that distance to the center. Um, you can do things like change the algorithm. So in the algorithm that we're using right now, we're basically saying, uh, where's my fractal? It's this. So if I did pow z two, I get the algorithm, the picture. If I do power Z three and just run that through a second. Just thinking about it. Done. Then you get actually a different fractal. It's a very similar fractal, but actually the number of nodes you get, the number of primary nodes you get, is actually equal to the power minus one. So I so three I've got two nodes on one I had one node on the left. And again, if I do that up, if I do, if I now do power of, oh, where's my calculation? The, the fractal here, if I go to the power of six, um, when it renders, we should have five primary nodes coming off the center core. Um, there we go. One, two, three, four, and five on the left. Um, and and that little things like that you can start discovering about fractal. Again, here, the, the, the actual boundary of that would still be infinite. Uh, you can change the algorithm massively. You can actually swap the arguments around. The point is it's an iterative algorithm. It's chaotic because you can't work out the nth term. You have to work out the nth minus one term first. You can't just jump to a term. Um, and that's it. That That's fractals in a nutshell. Working out better ways of doing colours, that's also doable. So here, instead of doing those 100 colours, I could do, as I said, I could do point divided by 10. Uh, sorry, um, uh, colour... Uh, C equals counter divide by 10. Give it a nice float, working float. So uh, 10, 9 goes down to 0. 
19 goes down to 10, 20 is, 20 is 2, or whatever, whatever that is. And then if I can do uh, 25 times colour C, um, T equals, I can do, uh, my tabs have gone all those, pixel, pixels, pixels, I, J equals T, 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 like that. And you end up with curves. So there's lots of ways of calculating curves. If I give you a number, work out colour for it. Uh, people often use things like... Um, um, so there's, there's less grey here, but you see it's less spotty as well because there is some grey coming in there. Um, I can do this as 5 instead for that. And then this will be 12.5 times the curve T. Um, you can calculate things. You could do one of these is 255 minus T, for example. And it will, it will do a, a different, more psychedelic colours, which people usually expect from fractals. The very first fractal, I think, was that. There we go. More psychedelic coloured fractals. The very first one I ever saw was um, um, the Mandelbrot's, or Mandelbrot's first one. I think it was just stars. He just put stars in. Um, that's the basic way of calculating fractals. That's basically what we're doing. We cal we've cal here we've calculated for every single point on the display. Uh, obviously, the more points you do, if you don't have 4K resolution displays and things, you can get very beautiful fractals. Uh, these are plain 2D fractals. I've got a 2D plane. Some people do 3D fractals and say, is there a point in space or not? Put that into Blender and then render out a display of a fractal, three-dimensional fractals. And the basics are still the same. Basically taking a point and saying, has that point left a, an actual uh, circle for 2D or sphere for 3D? Uh, you might decide, okay, I'm, I'm actually not going to use 2 as my answer. Uh, I'm going to put that back down to power 2. And actually I'm going to use, or I'm going to run it as well. Uh, and I'm actually going to say, have I left um, uh, uh, the circle of 2.5? Just for saying. Now, all that's going to do, really, is um, change the, the shape. All right? If the algorithm works for one, it'll work for that. And there you go, the shape of changes. It might make this more sharp. It might make it more steep. It might make the general curve more steep. Uh, but that's it. Uh, also, you can do things like if you want to center... I want to send this on um, uh, com uh, minus minus one naught. All you have to do here is just minus center naught and minus the center one, and then that will just shift the entire thing the wrong way because I actually uh, uh, you want to add those on, not minus them. Don't know why I would do that? Get make them make numbers make sense. Uh, and that just helps you get that. And, and for, for the Mandelbrot factor, that's a very powerful thing to, to put it there because you get all this long line coming out this way and cool stuff coming out. Uh, basically, uh, that is the uh, Mandelbrot fractal in a nutshell. Um, that is how to generate them in a nutshell, going from the vector mass, the iterative formulas, looking at whether it escapes a particular centre point. Um, what else can I say, really? It's 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 sort of a mark of beauty. You can zoom in. At the, what's interesting about fractals, you can now zoom in on these. So if I was to zoom in, if I change my scale, and and there is another thing I built, and I will do a separate video on that. Um, it's it, I, the second video is coming very very soon on that. Uh, basically, it's, it I use a different model of generating. I'll go into those models a bit more carefully. How you can optimize your code to to generate the fractals faster. Um, which you don't need to do with modern computers, but we did do with old computers. But basically, I can zoom in by saying, um, by zooming in by half. Um, it then just dies in. And you can basically keep on zooming in until your numbers, um, if I go uh, 3.4 like that. That's actually zooming out. So I want to go uh, 1, whatever size. Bang and I am beginning to zoom into a, a patch of purple. You can see these fractals. Now I'm getting closer in. These things will get more and more well defined. Uh, I can probably zoom in a bit more. Um, one point, not point three. That's probably way too much. That's way too much, isn't it? The problem you get is when you get a large area which escapes in the first go. There you go. That was way too much. But what I can do is I can shift that that center over to 1.5 um, because in the front there all these things escapes they, they iterate a hundred times before it breaks out whereas these ones break out rather quickly you see there's another Mandelbrot shape appearing here and another one appearing here at this point we can zoom in um, 
we can just keep on zooming in. 0.15, zoom in again. As you zoom in and zoom in, you start seeing these shapes are um, 0.25, uh, 0.5. I don't know if this is too much to get. You see, you, I, without that building so you can click on to actually zoom in, and you start seeing these shapes coming off, they're the same as the outer. And that's what makes it, that's what people think of fractal when you zoom in, you see self similarity over and over again. It's not always true, actually. Um, most fractals have an element of self similarity about them. But they are never the same. As you keep going in, they're always a little bit different because they're in a different position. Um, and that's just the wonderful, chaotic nature of fractals. Uh, it's something I find very beautiful. Maybe not with these colours, but uh, yeah, I think it's, it is what it is. So that's it for now. If you like this video, I'm sorry it's a bit long, uh, but please hit like, please hit subscribe. And uh, we'll see you in another episode later. If you have any comments about this, uh, any feedback, or if you give it a go yourself, Please share with me what you've done because I love seeing fractals. There is a great Reddit community, uh, I think it's our fractal actually, where people post their fractals. Um, and yeah, I, I, I love seeing fractals. I always have, uh, my dad introduced me with fractals when I was about seven or eight. Um, and at the time I didn't really understand the vector mathematics, but I did understand it was about a point leaving a circle and I could play around with the algorithms, I could play around just typing words in. Um, and seeing what it generates. Um, and also, I also found some of the generation algorithms, some of the process it would draw, some of the constructions of fractals were just as beautiful as fractals themselves. So I am a great fan of fractals. I, I, it is something that, that I've always have been a fan of. So I hope you find something interesting and beautiful about these as well. Um, but that, as I say, it's a very, very fast introduction into how to generate fractals from the comp and some of the theory behind these types of fractals. And I will stress there are other fractals out there which don't necessarily use complex numbers are in circles, they, they use other algorithms. Um, they use linear algorithms, they use repeating algorithms, they use repeating format. The Koch snowflake doesn't use that, they just go forward, go left, go forward, go left, something. Um, so, yeah, that is it from me. Until next time.